Good evening, everyone, and welcome to part two of Danny, the Champion of the World. And tonight, to help us with our story, is Sherlock, Watson's number one friend. Okay, so let us sit back, relax, and enjoy. Chapter three, cars, kites, and fire balloons. My father was a fine mechanic. People who lived miles away used to bring their cars to him for repair, rather than take them to their nearest garage. He loved engines. A petrol engine, he said, is sheer magic. Just imagine being able to take a thousand different bits of metal, and if you fit them all together in a certain way, and then if you feed them a little oil and petrol, and if you press a little switch, suddenly those bits of metal will all come to life and they will purr and hum and roar. They will make the wheels of a motor car go whizzing round at fantastic speeds. It was inevitable that I too should fall in love with engines and cars. And don't forget that even before I could walk, the workshop had been my playroom. For where else could my father have put me so that he could keep his eye on me all day long? My toys were the greasy cogs and springs and pistons that lay all over the place. And these, I can promise you, were far more fun to play with than most of the plastic stuff children are given these days. Mm. So almost from birth, I began training to be a mechanic. But now that I was five years old, there was the problem of school to think about. It was the law that parents must send their children to school at the age of five. And my father knew all about this. We were in the workshop, I remember, on my fifth birthday, when the talk about school started. I was helping my father to fit new brake linings to the rear wheel of a big Ford, when suddenly he said to me, You know something interesting, Danny? You must be easily the best five-year-old mechanic in the world. This was the greatest compliment he had ever paid me, and I was enormously pleased. You like this work, don't you, he said. All this messing around with engines? I absolutely love it, I said. He turned and faced me and laid a hand gently on my shoulder. I want to teach you to be a great mechanic, he said. And when you grow up, I hope you will become a famous designing engineer, a man who designs new and better engines for cars and aeroplanes. For that, he added, you will need a really good education. But I don't want to send you to a school quite yet. In another two years, you'll have learnt enough here with me to be able to take a small engine completely to pieces and put it back together again, all by yourself. And after that, you can go to school. You'll probably think my father was crazy trying to teach a young child to be an expert mechanic. But as a matter of fact, he wasn't crazy at all. I learned fast and I adored every moment of it. And luckily for us, nobody came knocking on the door to ask why I wasn't attending school. So for two more years, at the age of seven, believe it or not, I could really take a small engine to pieces and put it back together again. I mean properly to pieces, pistons and crankshafts and all. The time had come to start school. My school was in the nearest village, two miles away. We didn't have a car of our own, we couldn't afford one. But the walk took only half an hour, and I didn't mind in the least. My father came with me, he insisted on coming. And when school ended at four in the afternoon, he was always there waiting to walk me home. So life went on. The world I lived in consisted only of the filling station, the workshop, the caravan, the school, and of course, the woods and fields and streams in the countryside around. And I was never bored. It was impossible to be bored in my father's company. He was too sparky a man for that. Plots and plans and new ideas came flying off him like sparks from a grindstone. There's a good wind today, he said one Saturday morning, just right for flying a kite. Let's make a kite, Danny. So we made a kite. He showed me how to splice four thin, thin sticks together in the shape of a star, with two more sticks across the middle to brace it. Then we cut up an old blue shirt of his and stretched the material across the frame of the kite. 
we added a long tail made of thread with little leftover pieces of the shirt tied at intervals along it. Here's a picture of Danny and his dad flying the kite. We found a ball of string in the workshop and he showed me how to attach the string to the framework so that the kite would be properly balanced in flight. Now, if you would like, you could design a kite of your own during this home learning period. You can make it, build it, test it, perhaps even make a little YouTube clip and show me how your kite flies, as long as the wind's blowing, of course. Together, we walked to the top of the hill behind the filling station to release the kite. I found it hard to believe that this object, only made from a few sticks and a piece of old shirt, could actually fly. I held the string while my father held the kite, and the moment he let it go, it caught the wind and soared upwards like a huge blue bird. Let out some more string, Danny, he cried. Go on, as much as you like. Higher and higher soared the kite, and soon it was just a blue dot dancing in the sky, miles above my head, and it was thrilling to stand there, holding on to something that was so far away and so very much alive. This faraway thing was tugging and struggling on the end of the line like a big fish. Let's walk it back to the caravan, my father said. So we walked down the hill again, with me holding the string and the kite still pulling fiercely on the other end. And when he came to the caravan, we were careful not to get the string tangled in the apple tree, and we brought it all the way round to the front steps. Tie it to the steps, my father said. Will it stay up, I asked. It will if the wind doesn't drop, he said. And the wind didn't drop. And I will tell you something amazing. That kite stayed up there all through the night. And at breakfast time the next morning, the school, small blue dot was still dancing and swooping in the sky. And after breakfast, I hauled it down and hung it carefully against a wall in the workshop, ready to fly another day. Not long after that, on a lovely still evening, when there was no breath of wind, my father said to me, this is just the right weather for a fire balloon. Let's make a fire balloon. He must have planned this one beforehand because he had already brought the four big sheets of tissue paper and the pot of glue from Mr. Whitten's bookshop in the village. And now only the paper, the glue, a pair of scissors, and a piece of thin wire, he made me a huge, magnificent fire balloon in less than 15 minutes. In the opening at the bottom, he tied a small ball of cotton wool and we were ready to go. It was getting dark when we carried it outside into the field behind the caravan. We had with us a bottle of methylated spirit and some matches. I held the balloon upright while my father crouched underneath and carefully poured a little bit of meths onto the ball of cotton wool. Here goes, he said, putting a match to the cotton wool. Hold the sides out as much as you can, Danny. A tall yellow flame leapt up from the ball of cotton wool and went right inside the balloon. It'll catch on fire, I cried. No, it won't, he said, watch. Between us, we held the sides of the balloon as much as possible to keep them away from the flame in the early stages. But soon the hot air filled the balloon and the danger was over. She's nearly ready, my father said. Can you feel her floating? Yes, I said, yes. Shall we let it go? Not yet. Wait a bit longer. Wait until she's tugging to fly away. She's tugging now, I said. Right, he said. Let her go. Slowly, majestically, and in absolute silence, our wonderful balloon began to rise up into the night sky. It flies, I shouted, clapping my hands and jumping about. It flies, it flies. My father was nearly as excited as I was. It's a beauty, he said. That one's a real beauty. You never know how these things are going to turn out until you fly them. Each one is different. Up and up it went, rising very fast now into the cool night air. It was like a magic fireball in the sky. Will other people see it, I asked. I'm sure they will, Danny. It's high enough now for them to see it for miles around. What will they think of it, Dad? A flying saucer, my dad said. They'll probably call the police. A small breeze had taken hold of the balloon and was carrying it away in the direction of the village. Let's follow it, my father said, and with luck we'll find it when it comes down.
there's a fire balloon up in the sky. And this one isn't one you can do at home. Try the kite, much safer. We ran to the road. We ran along the road. We kept running. She's coming down, my father shouted. The flame's nearly gone out. We lost sight of it when the flame went out, but we guessed roughly which field it would be landing in. And we climbed over a gate and ran towards the place. For half an hour, we searched the field in darkness, but we couldn't find the balloon. The next morning, I went back alone to search again. I searched four big fields before I found it. It was lying in the corner of a field that was full of black and white cows. The cows were all standing around, staring with their huge wet eyes, but they hadn't harmed it one bit. So I carried it home and hung it alongside the kite against a wall in the workshop for another day. You can fly the kite all by yourself any time you like, my father said, but you must never fly the fire balloon unless I'm with you. It's extremely dangerous. All right, I said. Promise me you'll never try to fly it alone, Danny. I promise, I said. Then there was a tree house which was built high up in the top of the big oak tree at the bottom of our field. And the bow and, the bow and arrow, the bow a four foot long ash sapling and the arrows flighted with tail feathers of partridge and pheasant. And stilts that made me 10 feet tall and a boomerang that came back and fell at my feet nearly every time I threw it. And for my last birthday, there'd been something that was even more fun, perhaps, than all the rest. For two days before my birthday, I'd been forbidden to enter the workshop because my father was in there working on a secret. And on my birthday morning, out came an amazing machine made from four bicycle wheels and several large soap boxes. But this was no ordinary wizard. It had a pedal, it had a brake pedal, a steering wheel, a comfortable seat and a strong front bumper to take the shock of a crash. Now, what Danny's dad has made him there, as you can see, is a go-kart. I called it Sopo and just about every day I would take it up to the top of the hill in the field behind the filling station and come shooting down again at incredible speeds riding like a bronco over the bumps. So you can see that being eight years old and living with my father was a lot of fun. But I was impatient to be nine. I reckon that being nine would be even more fun than being eight. And as it turned out, I was not altogether right about this. My ninth year was certainly more exciting than any others, but not all of it was exactly what you would call fun. Chapter four, my father's deep, dark secret. Here I am at the age of nine. This picture was made just before all the excitement started and I didn't have a worry in the world. You will learn as you get older, just as I learned that autumn that no father is perfect. Grown-ups are complicated creatures, full of quirks and secrets, and some have quirky quirks and deeper secrets than others, but all of them, including one's own parents, have two or three private habits hidden up their sleeves that would probably make you gasp if you knew about them. The rest of this book is about a most private and secret habit my father had and about the strange adventures it led us both into. It all started on a Saturday evening. It was the first Saturday of September. Around six o'clock, my father and I had supper together in the caravan as usual. And when I went to bed, my father told me a fine story and kissed me goodnight, and I fell asleep. For some reason, I woke up again during the night. I lay listening, listening for the sound of my father's breathing in the bunk above mine but I could hear nothing. He wasn't there. I was certain of that. This meant that he had gone back to the workshop to finish a job. He often did that after tucking me in. I listened for the usual workshop sounds, the little clinking noises of metal against metal or the tap of a hammer. They always confirmed to me tremendously 
Sorry, they always comforted me tremendously, those noises in the night, because they told me my father was close at hand. But on this night, no sound was coming from the workshop. The filling station was silent. I got out of my bunk and found a box of matches by the sink. I struck one and held it up to the funny old clock that hung on the wall above the kettle. It was ten past eleven. I went to the door of the caravan. Dad, I said softly. Dad, are you there? No answer. There was a small wooden platform outside the caravan door, about four feet above the ground. I stood on the platform and gazed around me. Dad, I called out. Where are you? Still no answer. In my pyjamas and bare feet, I went down the caravan steps and crossed over to the workshop. I switched on the light. The old car we had been working on through the day was still there, but not my father. I've already told you he did not have a car of his own, so there was no question of him having gone for a drive. He wouldn't have done that anyway. I was sure he would never willingly have left me alone in the filling station at night. In which case, I thought, he must have fainted suddenly for some awful illness or fallen down and banged his head. I would need a light if I was going to find him. I took the torch from the bench in the workshop. I looked in the office. I went around and searched behind the office and behind the workshop. I ran down to the field. It was empty. Dad, I shouted in the darkness. Dad, where are you? I ran back to the caravan. I shone the light into his bunk to make absolutely sure he wasn't there. He wasn't in his bunk. I stood in the dark caravan for the first time in my life. I felt a touch of panic. The filling station was a long way from the nearest farmhouse. I took the blanket from my bunk, put it round my shoulders. Then I went out of the caravan door and sat on the platform with my feet on top of the step of the ladder. There was a new moon in the sky and across the road the big field lay, lay pale and deserted in the moonlight. The silence was deathly. I don't know how long I sat there. It may have been one hour. It could have been two. But I never dozed off. I wanted to keep listening all the time. If I listened very carefully, I might hear something that would tell me where he was. Then, at last, from far away, I heard the faint tap tap of footsteps on the road. The footsteps were coming closer and closer. Tap, 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 tap. Was it him or was it somebody else? I sat still, watching the road. I could see very far along it. It faded away into a misty moonlight darkness. Tap, 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 came the footsteps. Then out of the mist a figure appeared. It was him. I jumped down the steps and ran onto the road to meet him. Danny, he cried. What on earth's the matter? I thought something awful had happened to you, I said. He took my hand in his and walked me back to the caravan in silence. Then he tucked me into my bunk. I'm so sorry, he said. I should never have done it. But you don't usually wake up, do you? Where did you go, Dad? You must have been tired out, he said. I'm not a bit tired. Couldn't we light the lamp for a little while? My father put a match to the wick of the lamp hanging from the ceiling. And the little yellow flame sprang up and filled the inside of the caravan with a pale light. How about a hot drink, he said. Oh, yes, please. He lit the paraffin burner and put the kettle on to boil. I have decided something, he said. I'm going to let you in on the deepest, darkest secret of my whole life. I was sitting up in my bunk, watching my father. You ask me where I've been, he said. The truth is, I was up in Hazel's Wood. Hazel's Wood, I cried, that's miles away. Six and a half, my father said. I know, I sh shouldn't have gone and I'm very, very sorry about it. But as such a powerful yearning, his voice trailed away into nothingness. But why would you want to go all the way up to Hazel's Wood, I asked. He spooned cocoa powder and sugar into two mugs, doing it very slowly and levelling each spoonful as though he was measuring medicine. Do you know what is meant by poaching, he asked. Poaching? No, not really. It means going up into the woods in the dead of night and coming back with something for the pot. Poachers in other places poach all sorts of different things. 
but around here it's always pheasants. You mean stealing them, I said, aghast. We don't look at it that way, my father said. Poaching is an art. A great poacher is a great artist. Is that actually what you are doing in Hazel's Wood, Dad? Poaching pheasants? I was practicing the art, he said, the art of poaching. I was shocked. My own father, a thief, this gentle, lovely man. I couldn't believe he would go creeping into the woods at night to pinch valuable birds belonging to someone else. The kettle's boiling, I said. Ah, so it is. He poured the water into the mugs and brought mine over to me. Then he fetched his own and sat with it at the end of my bunk. Your granddad, he said, my own dad, was a magnificent and splendiferous poacher. It was he who taught me all about it. I caught the poaching fever from him when I was about 10 years old and I've never lost it since. Mind you, in those days, just about every man in our village was out in the woods at night poaching pheasants. And they did it not only because they loved the sport, but because they needed the food for their families. See, when I was a boy, times were bad. For a lot of people in England, there was very little work to be had, and some families were literally starving. Yet a few miles away, in the rich man's woods, thousands of pheasants were being fed like kings twice a day. So can you blame my dad for going out occasionally and coming back with a bird or two for the family to eat? No, I said, of course not. But we're not starving here, Dad. Oh, you've missed the point, Danny boy. You've missed the whole point. Poaching is just a fabulous and exciting sport that once you start doing it, it gets into your blood, see? And you can't give it up. Just imagine, he said, leaping off the bunk and waving his mug in the air. Just imagine for a minute that you are all alone up there in the dark woods and the wood is full of keepers hiding behind the trees and the keepers have guns. Guns, I gasped. They don't have guns. All keepers have guns, Danny. It's for the vermin, mostly. The foxes and the stoats and the weasels who go after the pheasants. But they will always take a pot shot at a poacher too if they spot it. Dad, you're joking. Not at all. But they only do it from behind only when you're trying to escape. They like to pepper you in the legs at about 50 yards. They can't do that, I cried. They could go to prison for shooting someone. You could go to prison for poaching, my father said. And there was a glint and a sparkle in his eyes now that I'd never seen before. Many's the night when I was a boy, Danny. I've gone into the kitchen and seen my old dad lying face down on the table a mum standing over him, digging the gunshot pellets out of his backside with a potato knife. It's not true, I said, starting to laugh. You don't believe me? Yes, I believe you. Towards the end, he was so covered in tiny white scars that it looked exactly like it was snowing. I don't know why I'm laughing, I said. It's not funny, it's horrible. Poacher's bottom, they used to call it, my father said. And there wasn't a man in the whole village who hadn't had a bit of it one way or another. But my dad was the champion. How's the cocoa? Oh, it's fine, thank you. If you're hungry, we could have a midnight feast, he said. Could we, Dad? Of course. My father got out the bread tin and the butter and cheese and started making sandwiches. Let me tell you about this phony pheasant shooting business, he said. First of all, it's practised only by the rich. Only the very rich can afford to rear pheasants just for the gun of shooting them down when they grow up. These wealthy idiots spend huge sums of money every year buying baby pheasants from the pheasant farm, rearing them up in pens until they're big enough to be put into the woods. In the woods, the young birds hang about in flocks like chickens. They are guarded by keepers and fed twice a day on the best corn until they're so fat they can hardly fly. Then beaters are hired to walk through the woods, clapping their hands and making all sorts of noise that will drive the pheasants up, up into the sky towards the men with their guns. And after that, it's bang, bang, bang! And down they come. Would you like strawberry jam on one of these? Yes, please, I said. One jam and one cheese. But Dad, what? How do you actually catch the pheasants when you're poaching? Do you have a gun hidden away up there? A gun? He cried, disgusted. Real poachers don't shoot peasants, Danny. 
<sighs> Didn't you know that? You've only got to fire a cat pistol up there in the woods and the keepers will be on you. Then how do you do it? Ah, my father said, and his eyelids drooped over his eyes, veiled and secretive. He spread strawberry jam thickly on a piece of bread, taking his time. These things are big secrets, he said, very big secrets indeed. But I reckon if my father could tell them to me, then maybe I can tell them to you. Would you like me to do that? Yes, I said, tell me now. And we'll tell you Danny's father's secrets tomorrow when we have part three of Danny the Champion of the World. Good night.